Welcome to another episode of Pacific Matters. My name is Tomas Manglonia, and we have more CNMI Decision 2022 coverage. On this episode, we're turning our focus to the CNMI Attorney General's race. First, we sit down with the current Attorney General, Edward Manabusan. Tell us uh, a little bit about yourself and why you're deciding to run for re-election. Well, about myself, it's been a long journey. Um, some 34 years in this government now. Uh, started after law school, uh, joined the Public Defender's Office, and I became a prosecutor for a number of years. I became the chief prosecutor at one point in time. Uh, and after that, uh, uh, I think uh, Governor Tenorio saw that um, he needed someone at the Department of Public Safety and appointed me to be the director of public safety for, uh, I think, three, uh, three and a half years. And uh, right after that was a change administration. I went into private practice. And uh, years later, while in private practice, I got a uh, call and uh, was appointed to become uh, an associate judge of the Superior Court. And I, I joined and stayed there for uh, 10 years. Uh, and then I became the presiding judge. Uh, retired uh, after 10 years of service, uh, went out on, in the private practice after that for 10 years and of course you know in year 2012 uh, the people decided to have an elected AG and uh, I was still in private practice and I thought hey I can still contribute to the community and so I, I put my name in and I ran in 2014 election the first AG election, and uh, since then I've been the Attorney General for, what, seven and a half years now. And uh, looking back at your accomplishments, <coughs> what are some of your highlights you would say as the first elected AG? Yeah. You know, uh, if you recall, right, the, um, uh, for, for many years, uh, in 19, I think, 1977, when the first Constitution was ratified, uh, the Attorney General was appointed by the governor throughout the years until 2012. And I think that uh, in 2012 there were some uh, issues regarding how the Attorney General's office was being run. And the people I, bet, I guess uh, were fed up with uh, the, the political nature of the office and so decided, hey, look, uh, we've got to take that power of appointment and decide to, to make that an elected office. And the, and the, uh, the major part of that decision was they wanted to get rid of the office's political interference. And so they did. Um, and so this office, just a reminder to people that uh, this office is fairly new. Uh, in 2015 was the first uh, AG under the new regime, right? And so there was a lot of changes. I mean, uh, the Constitution placed this office uh, as, the, um, uh, as the office that would be in charge of the legal affairs of the Commonwealth. Unlike before, uh, when the agencies uh, were allowed to hire their own attorneys, autonomous agencies were allowed to hire their own attorneys. In 2012, uh, the Constitution consolidated all of the legal affairs that come off into the agency's office. So when I took office, the first thing what I needed to do was to ensure a smooth transition, change the office structure, make sure that uh, it would survive, you know, uh, what the Constitution has, um, has told uh, this office to do. Um, so in, in that sense, I first was established the uh, uh, office policies and procedures. Uh, which I, uh, I have here, uh, creating the office, the structure, the legal structure of the office. That was the very first one, and that's, that's major because it delineates the responsibility of the office, how we were going to, um, uh, how we were going to provide the legal services to the agencies. And throughout this last seven years, it has been actually a challenge because of the newness of the office and uh, think the agencies weren't not uh, accustomed to, to the way that uh, the office was going to handle the legal affairs of the Commonwealth, which is centralization. And so um, it was very difficult, and even up to today, 
I think there's still some kind of resistance to what we do here in terms of um, how how much uh, how much um, work we do and and how much we uh, we make the agencies and the government try to um, uh, apply the rule of law consistently, and that is kind of like a, a um, uh, what a, a challenge. And so throughout these years, one of the things that we were doing was allowing the agencies to do their work as they are allowed by their own enabling statute, uh, creating, uh, developing their own policies. And, and we direct our attention on the legal advice that's necessary to uh, run the agencies efficiently. Um, and so that's where the kind of like the, uh, the challenge is like, why aren't you not allowing us to do this, right? And uh, well, because the rule of law, the law says you can't do that, this is how you do it. But that, I think, is going to, uh, is one of the major challenges, and I think we're developing uh, uh, this office and our relationship with the, agis, uh, the agencies much more in a better way now. I think there's much more understanding of what we do. We don't interfere with policy decisions uh, of the agencies, uh, but we, we, certainly, we certainly tell them you can't do that if it uh, does not uh, comport with the law. AG, I did want to um, shift our conversation to uh, the first ever uh, criminal charges filed against a sitting governor uh, of the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. uh, that happened uh, under your watch. Uh, I'm sure you've heard uh, some of the public comments and sentiment uh, of that nature. Uh, some say that uh, the charges, um, you know, uh, happened uh, rightfully so, and others say that it took too long and that it was a target. Can you just address mm. the nature of those charges and why ultimately you as the AG decided to pursue them? Okay, so, uh, you know, the, the Constitution also uh, says that uh, and directs that uh, the office is the, the office is in charge of prosecution or violations of Commonwealth law. And it'd be the governor, um, any other person that is charged with a crime will pursue uh, considering first that there are facts to support it, uh, the bring in the charges, uh, and, and we do this all of this methodically. Uh, and we, just to remember that charging a person without any basis is really um, uh, against the law for <laughs> to begin with. And uh, our job is, is to ensure that uh, uh, we promote, I mean, we ensure justice, not just prosecution, uh, but we follow the law when we review cases, and uh, if there are, if there's probable cause to charge, we will charge. I can't talk much about uh, the current uh, case because it's pending court, and, and there's a rule that you cannot discuss matters that's pending. So I, ca I can't say any more than that. All right, but, but you, you would you say it, it's would you defend saying it wasn't a targeted uh, case? Well, I think the court. Uh, already re rule on that in a recent decision. Uh, one must just read the court's decision and make that uh, 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 decision for him or herself. Uh, the court has actually dealt with that already. All right, I wanted to talk to you about the day-to-day -day matters here at the Attorney General's mm -hmm. office. What is your office currently occupied with? What has been some of the major um, uh, issue areas that you've been addressing with, with your legal team here? Yeah. So, you know, this office is really just a, a function of uh, being one of the biggest law firms on the island. Uh, we have the, uh, the uh, child support section here. We, we continue to, uh, to ensure that the children out there uh, receive the child support that they're, that they're entitled to from, uh, from their parents. Uh, we have the consumer council uh, that, uh, that does uh, on a daily basis uh, investigation and consumer complaints. And uh, there are currently uh, investigations on uh, many different uh, consumers. And at the same time, we're doing also multi-state litigation 
uh, areas such as the generic drugs. We, we are engaged in an antitrust uh, lawsuit where we uh, join other states in, uh, against uh, pharma pharmaceuticals uh, for uh, setting the price of uh, generic drugs. Uh, we are also involved in PFAS litigation. It's in, now it's uh, in multi-state uh, district. Uh, we are also involved with opioid. As a matter of fact, we have just received our first batch of, of settlement payments in the opi opioid uh, settlement, uh, around about 300 some thousand dollars to use to abate uh, opioid and other substance abuse. Uh, in the local, and, and one of the big things that we did to for Guam uh, was the CERCLA case. Uh, if you remember the order dump, uh, we spearheaded, this office spearheaded the amicus uh, brief in the Supreme Court, uh, and, and Guam won that case, and now it's, be, it's back to, to, to Guam uh, for trial. Uh, that's, a, that's a major accomplishment. We, we are also engaged in other litigation here right now um, on many different mm, uh, levels. We have uh, employment, uh, uh, we're defending the Commonwealth employment uh, lawsuits. Uh, we're defending the Commonwealth in land compensation cases. Uh, we're defending the Commonwealth in, in, in other cases as well. I mean, there is very much uh, ongoing. I can't say which ones are these, but there, there are several of them. to talk about your opponent now. There's, uh, you're running up against former Judge uh, Lizama, and as you said, uh, you both served on the bench. Uh, you, you both had a time on the bench together. Yeah. Uh, what's your comment on, on his campaign being mounted against you? Uh, it was filed just days before the deadline, mm -hmm. so uh, you now, uh, it is a two-person race now. Oh, yeah, I, I don't really know what his campaign is all about, and I, I never really read about it. I, I, I see his advertisement, um, and that's basically it. But I don't know what he is, uh, his campaign is all about, and I try to do my work here, and I try to, uh, you know, primarily deal with my own campaign. And uh, that's basically is coming to work every day, doing the work of the people, and, and continue the work of this office to make it uh, more efficient for the government as a whole. I, I also wanted to ask you uh, about, uh, you know, some, some other cases. Uh, uh, how, when, when do you decide, how do you decide when, when to get involved into, uh, you know, cases uh, outside of the Commonwealth and, you know, join Guam or join other state attorneys general uh, in their litigation? Uh, yeah. What's your thought process, and, and wh how do you decide it's time for the CMI to, to get involved? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, we, we looked at the overall result of what the, the lawsuit is trying to achieve. For example, in, in the Guam case, I mean, we know that, that uh, the military has had uh, um, done work out here. And if the military has done work out here and left, and left us to to handle all of the damages or to remediate what they've done without the military or the United States government being involved. Uh, that's why we entered the CERCLA case, the, the Help the Guam case, because what, what happened in Guam was the United States says they were not responsible for, for the damages there and said, oh, look, uh, you can't just cause damage and, and not say we're responsible for part of it. Uh, so it has an overall effect here. The, the, the opiate is very easy. I mean, opiate and drugs and substance abuse occur here, and so we follow the state. I think there's a benefit to joining that. Uh, just, just like the generic drugs, just like the PFAS, uh, where can, water is contaminated, you, you see reports from CUC about contamination of the water wells. And so we're trying to, uh, we got involved because we think it has a general public interest and benefit to, to joining those kinds of lawsuits. And when it comes to building the CNMI jurisprudence uh, and uh, our position as a commonwealth, uh, how, how do you maintain that balance as the Attorney General on uh, maintaining you know, what's outlined in the Constitution and Covenant, but also 
challenges, you know, to some federal law and, and, and lawsuits. You know, I'm thinking about the second, you know, gun, gun rights and things of that nature right. that maybe, uh, it, you know, hasn't been explicitly written in, in, our, in our Constitution. So what's your thought process there when you yeah. have an, an approach to those cases? Yeah. So like, for example, the gun case, we know that uh, that, that case uh, went all the way to the Supreme Court. And what the Supreme Court declared uh, in respect to the Second Amendment is the law of the land. And so this is what we call the law of the supremacy clause, right? So uh, when the Supreme Court says this is the law of the land, uh, Article uh, 2 uh, of the uh, Amendment 2 of the Constitution, that applies in the United States, applies to the cinema, we have to, to live with it, uh, just like other cases as well. My thought is, in some of these cases where the federal government, the statute intrudes in our, in our area, that there could be a claim that it's unconstitutional because it intrudes in our, in our jurisprudence, uh, juris, uh, jurisdiction. But the other, the other fix to that is really just having those statutes amended. And, and so I think about issues uh, in, in the long run, even like, uh, you know, the abortion uh, issue. Uh, uh, are, are those things that, the, that, the, that your office would, would, you know, get involved in if it were to become an issue here in the Congo? Right. You know, the abortion is prohibited uh, by our Constitution. And uh, should an abortion be uh, performed here, it is our obligation to, to look at, at, at that issue. Uh, and and see whether or not a, a crime has been committed, that the person may, uh, that did the abortion, uh, you know, uh, is did it beyond medical necessities, right? Uh, it's a complicated field, and uh, prosecuting prosecuting someone who has done that will require a lot of uh, research and be, you know, like I said, how we review cases methodically. Uh, the other fix to that too is that the legislature can provide for that, um, uh, allow abortion for in certain limited circumstances. to uh, your, your staff here. Uh, is the AG's office currently adequately staffed or what are some of the needs to address uh, you know, all, all of the cases that the AG's office yeah. is handling? What, what, what's your opinion on that as, as the AG? Uh, we, are, we are understaffed right now and we we've, we've try to work with uh, the governor and the legislature in providing us the necessary uh, staff. Uh, if you understand our role in the Commonwealth, like I said, has been consolidated in this office. And so we're responsible for, for legal, giving legal advice to 15 executive departments, autonomous agencies, and public corporations. That's a lot. And we only have 11 attorneys right now in this office compared to 15 executive departments. We're handling lawsuits of major proportion. Uh, we have our criminal cases that we're, we're dealing with, the drugs and the uh, sexual assaults and so forth. Uh, we are understaffed uh, tremendously, and so we cannot accomplish our uh, duty and obligation our Constitution if we're not staffed uh, to provide those uh, needed uh, legal services to the Commonwealth. So 11 attorneys, what would be the ideal? Uh, we, we, right now, we, we ask the legislature in a 23 budget for additional nine uh, vacancies, nine FTEs. So that will, uh, will split between here and the, and the criminal division. Criminal division has uh, five, uh, going to be six attorneys soon. We need at least eight lawyers down there, and the rest will be up at civil. Yeah. Okay. And uh, that's all the questions I had. I wanted to see if you wanted to add uh, anything else I might not have touched upon, uh, or if not, um, wanted to address again uh, why uh, viewers and voters should uh, vote for you uh, yeah. in the next election. Yeah. I think you, you need a, uh, an attorney uh, an AG um, to provide a steady leadership here, uh, someone with experience. Uh, if, if you were to uh, hire someone, get someone from outside, it may, it may take a couple of months, maybe years to understand the, the work of this office. You need someone who's strong-willed, 
uh, you need someone who has integrity and uh, will apply the rule of law, uh, even in situations where uh, they are not, uh, um, you know, uh, something that uh, supported by people. I mean, you just have to do your work. You gotta have to have a strong-willed uh, person here who understands uh, the nature of the work and committed to the rule of law. All right. Thank All right. you so much.